Stephen Hoffenberg, one of Jeffrey Epstein's close friends and business associates, is believed to be dead. Police in Derby, Connecticut, say they found a body earlier this week in Hoffenberg's apartment, but the body was, quote, in a state where a visual identification could not be made. A full dental evaluation has been ordered to positively identify the body. An autopsy revealed no trauma, but the cause of death is still under investigation. Hoffenberg met Epstein in the late 1980s and hired him to work at Towers Financial Corporation. Towers Financial turned out to be one of the biggest Ponzi schemes in U.S. history, bilking investors out of nearly half a billion dollars. Hoffenberg is the second former business associate of Jeffrey Epstein to die this year. French modeling agent Jean-Luc Brunel, in jail on accusations of raping a minor, was found dead in his cell of an apparent suicide. Epstein himself was found hanging in a New York jail cell in 2019. His death was also ruled a suicide. And in 1987, he had just been hired by Stephen Hoffenberg, the founder of Towers Financial. So let's come back to you. Why did you hire Jeffrey? Stupidity. <laughs> okay, but now you have the benefit of hindsight, a lot of hindsight. But if you can put yourself in your shoes back then, back in 1987, what did a younger, uh, more naive version of you see? in him very deep rooted greed and stupidity on my part to go near jeffrey epstein or this assortment of criminals so remember hoffenberg would end up running an enormous ponzi scheme 450 million dollars the biggest in american history before bernie madoff Hoffenberg was convicted in 1995, so he was still in prison serving a 20-year sentence when I was reporting in 2002. So once I learned of his partnership with Jeffrey, which was not something that Jeffrey advertised, by the way, I wrote to the warden of the Federal Medical Center in Devons, Massachusetts. I asked if Steve Hoffenberg would see me. I was told very quickly that he would. So one sunny fall day, I found myself flying to Boston and catching a cab for the short trip to Devon's. Prison visit rules stipulate that you have to dress as unprovocatively as possible. And I was now five or so months pregnant with twins, so it was a little tricky to hide my curves. I got some strange looks from the corrections officers as they patted me down. But then I was led through the hallways and into a wreck area where all the inmates would gather for breaks all dressed in their orange jumpsuits. It was slightly surreal. I was shown to a little room off to one side. And then voila, Steve Hoffenberg entered. He was tall, thin, and he had wispy graying hair. But most strikingly, he had a big grin on his face. He couldn't have been more pleased to see me. He was dying to talk about Jeffrey. And I was dying to hear what he had to say. So we sat there and we chatted. I took notes because tape recorders weren't allowed in the prison. Hoffenberg wanted our conversation to be off the record. This wasn't surprising. He was afraid of Jeffrey, but he was also obsessed with him, what Jeffrey had done to him. By the time I left the prison, believe it or not, I felt sorry for Steve Hoffenberg. And he then started to write to me from time to time, and we've stayed in touch throughout the years. Now that Jeffrey's dead though, Steve Hoffenberg will answer all of my questions on the record. To you, I mean, you were already in prison. Do you think he would have tried? What, what could he have done to you? I had a risk, a danger, from all the transactions that I knew about pertaining to Jeffrey Epstein and his business. I'm Vicki Ward, and this is Chasing Gillette, Episode 6, Playing the Box. It was an eye-opening prison visit. Hoffenberg took me through a whole chapter of Jeffrey's career that Jeffrey had most definitely wanted to keep quiet. So Jeffrey and Hoffenberg were similar. 
Self-made men who were willing to cut corners. Both of them had rough edges, and both of them had thick Brooklyn accents. Now, outwardly, this looks like we are millions of miles away from the glittering world of a young Ghislaine Maxwell. But it's relevant to her story because the money that Jeffrey could make off of Hoffenberg would form the first layer of serious wealth that would attract other rich people into his web. Critically, Ghislaine. According to Hoffenberg, he and Ghislaine never met, although Ghislaine most certainly knew about his existence. At least that's according to Hoffenberg and one other source. But Hoffenberg, for the most part, was somebody who Jeffrey wanted kept a complete secret. Unlike Jeffrey's other mentor, Douglas Lees, Hoffenberg had little, if any, veneer of respectability. He reminded people more of a gangster than of a suave Cary Grant. And even though Hoffenberg was politically connected, Governor Mark White of Texas and Congressman Tom Evans of Delaware were on the board of Towers Financial. Hoffenberg was never accepted as a member of New York's establishment. I thought he was a fairly scary person. Ed Epstein is the journalist who was close with both Jeffrey and Ghislaine. He met Hoffenberg. This guy was a true criminal. He carried a gun. He had a bodyguard. He was a large-scale character. And so he was sort of Jeffrey's first entry into the multi-million dollar sphere. They must have looked like a bit of a strange couple two Brooklyn-born outsiders on the fringe of high society. But Jeffrey planned to turn Towers Financial, which was chiefly a debt collector, into a financial powerhouse of funding money products around the world. And Jeffrey Epstein had a detailed plan, project, to do that. And I was stupid enough to go along with this. Stupid enough, Hoffenberg says, because Jeffrey wanted to do this illegally. Separately, Jeffrey told Hoffenberg he wanted to use the network of rich people that he was building for his political influence campaign, also for his own financial gain. The idea was that he target those who he considered were, quote, not fastidious and whom he could therefore rip off and especially those who would not likely go to the authorities. On a bit of a bad phone line during the pandemic, I asked Hoffenberg about how exactly Jeffrey planned to do this. Say he has four clients. Each one invests with him. He basically robs Peter to pay Paul. He keeps juggling them around. But where he actually makes his money, the pot that goes to the Jeffrey Epstein Corporation, is from the fixed investments. And, and basically, he gets these people to trust him so much, he's the only one who's reporting on their assets to them. So he will tell them, for example, I've invested in a $50 million property in the middle of nowhere in the Caribbean. But in fact, the property would only be worth $25 million and Jeffrey had taken the other $25 million into Jeffrey and Co. That's what you said in 2002. Does that, does that ring a bell? That's an example of a process that he would use. The numbers would have to be verified by appraisals on the properties if they were real estate, but that's how he operated his business, by inflating the assets. In order for that to work, these people would have to give him complete control because he couldn't have someone checking over his shoulder. Well, it's not exactly that way. He had authority from these people as a manager to do transactions, not to put the money in his pocket. He had the authority to direct the bank to invest the client's monies into different transactions. Right. Why was he telling you this? Why were you going to help him? Well, he was always brainstorming with me as to his plans of making money. 
Hoffenberg told me that Jeffrey had a name for his manipulations. Playing the box. Now, essentially, this means locking down all four corners of the deal so that it's impossible for your deception to be exposed. A frequent tactic was to own his victims to the point that even if they discovered the fraud, there was absolutely nothing that they could do about it. I recall the conversations where Jeffrey Epstein said he was going to manipulate rig or fix or tamper with the four corners of the transactions so that he could keep money for himself. And you call this playing the box? Well, the box is the four corner terminology used on this type of a legal transaction, playing or rigging or manipulating the box, which is the transaction. Did he tell you when you were hiring him and when you were talking about, you know, playing the box and, and, and taking money from people, did he tell you that he'd already done that? He did explain to me and without pinpointing conversations 20 years ago or 25 years ago, he did explain to me what he was doing on taking the money and money laundering and the crimes, yes. So Hoffenberg hired Jeffrey after he learned all about Jeffrey's talent as a criminal mastermind. That was exactly why Hoffenberg hired him. But Hoffenberg didn't put Jeffrey on the tower's payroll, however. Jeffrey was a consultant whose grand office space on Madison Avenue Hoffenberg paid for. This, by the way, was Jeffrey's idea. It was to avoid paying income tax, according to Hoffenberg. So all this was in the late 1980s. Even at the peak of his success, Steve Hoffenberg was not considered the kind of associate one would have boasted about on Wall Street. The receptionists at Towers Financial packed heat. Now, as I've said before, Hoffenberg is a tricky source. The judge's sentencing memorandum in his fraud case noted that his repeated lies had rendered him completely untrustworthy. However, most of what he told me back in that prison cell has subsequently completely checked out. It was Hoffenberg who told me where to find the truth of why Jeffrey had left Bear Stearns. Hoffenberg told me to find the depositions from the SEC investigation of Bear Stearns. And remember, Hoffenberg had been sitting in prison telling me all this because he believed that the way Jeffrey had been able to manipulate him was both absolutely masterful and personally devastating. Hoffenberg is definitely not an innocent, but Jeffrey used that to his advantage. So this whole saga began back in the late 1980s. This is the time period when Jeffrey allegedly may have been meeting sporadically with Robert Maxwell. It's also when he's allegedly working with Douglas Lees and getting involved in what Hoffenberg describes somewhat nebulously as, quote, national security issues. Julian Lees says that his father and Jeffrey stopped working together by the late 1980s, though he does admit that his father was in contact and working with Hoffenberg. Jeffrey and Hoffenberg came up with a financial plan, which was to bid on two airlines, Pan Am and Emery Air Freight. But to make those bids, they needed money, which they didn't have. So they purchased the parent company of two Illinois insurance firms, and they then used the bonds of the insurers as collateral to raise money on Wall Street. This is a completely illegal use of insurance bonds. But why go to all the trouble to bid on these two airlines? What was the point? I believe he wanted to transport drugs and illegal assets by Emory Airport, and I believe he wanted to move the money around in illegal money transactions. 
Owning a freight airline would be a useful vehicle for laundering money, guns, diamonds, you name it. But this greed is what brought about Hoffenberg's downfall. He wasn't watching his back. To win the bid, Jeffrey set up various brokerage accounts through Hoffenberg's company, Towers Financial. Then he used those accounts to favorably manipulate the airline's stock. Now this is playing the box. All of this is in court records. Hoffenberg says that Jeffrey effectively had autonomy over these brokerage accounts. Now remember, they're in the name of Towers Financial. Sound familiar? It's exactly the same way that Jeffrey stole from his Spanish clients years earlier. Because he opened up accounts for Towers Financial and transferred monies into those accounts for years from the company and from investors, both from transactions. But how could he do that without your knowledge? I didn't have anything to do with approving transfers for those accounts. Jeffrey Epstein was autonomous with that and with whatever else he did, which the documents and the evidence will show that I wanted to explain to the court, that I asked to explain to Judge Abrams repeatedly. That's in the grand jury record. The grand jury record that Hoffenberg is referring to is from 1993. As perhaps seems obvious now, Towers Financial was facing a number of criminal investigations from these, well, criminal activities. In his grand jury testimony, Hoffenberg described Jeffrey as both the mastermind behind the insurance bond scheme and also the, quote, technician of a stock manipulation scheme on Wall Street. Hoffenberg described his own role as hardly that of a supporting cast member. As Hoffenberg's legal troubles deepened, poof, Jeffrey was suddenly gone. His name never showed up again in the ongoing criminal investigations into Towers Financial. Prosecutors said that the company was running a $450 million Ponzi scheme, as well as the illegal scheme involving the Illinois insurance bonds. But here's what Hoffenberg didn't realize. Jeffrey had left Hoffenberg high and dry. Behind Hoffenberg's back, Jeffrey had cooperated with the government. And it gets worse. If you're Hoffenberg, that is. He claims that all along, Jeffrey was taking vast sums out of Towers Financial, all behind Hoffenberg's back. I have calculated and added up some $100 million from various corners of the page Besides just the brokerage accounts that Jeffrey Epstein was involved in, in looting from Towers Financial with others. Not Jeffrey Epstein alone, but he was intimately involved with Towers Financial after I left Towers Financial. Throughout two, including the year 2000. Hoffenberg says that the transfers happened through brokers at Bear Stearns and other places, all while he was tied up with litigation. And there was nothing that Hoffenberg could do about this. He says that tactically, he had made a very important mistake. He had pled guilty. This meant that there was no trial and that the government limited its discovery and its interest in other people. You may not know this, but when a person pleads guilty, the person loses certain rights. In criminal courts, those are first, the right to counsel if unrepresented, second, the right to a jury trial, third, the right not to incriminate themselves, and fourthly, the right to confront and cross-examine their accusers. In Hoffenberg's case, it also left him less time. Time to give the government proof of Jeffrey's alleged role in Towers Financial at least the role that Hoffenberg claims Jeffrey played. He would have been exposed earlier on if I didn't plead guilty. You had pled guilty very early on, thereby removing the need for the government to do huge amounts of discovery. Yes, which stopped the government needing to expose Jeffrey Epstein.
In March 1993, Tower's Financial filed for bankruptcy, and Hoffenberg would eventually be sent to jail for almost 20 years. Ghislaine, meanwhile, is Jeffrey's girlfriend, or chief girlfriend. She knows about Hoffenberg's existence, but never met him, according to Hoffenberg. And Jeffrey's other big lifeline, Les Wexner, certainly didn't know about Hoffenberg at the time. At least Jeffrey told Hoffenberg that he was being kept a secret. Hoffenberg would most certainly have hurt Jeffrey's reputation with Wexner. And with all the other big shots that Jeffrey was now courting. Apparently, it didn't occur to Hoffenberg that Jeffrey would secretly cooperate with the government against him. Or that Jeffrey would siphon off Tower's money behind his back. But it probably should have. Hoffenberg knew who Jeffrey was when he hired him. He knew what his MO was. Gain your clients complete trust and then take their money. Jeffrey played the box on Hoffenberg. I was taken aback and understood that Jeffrey Epstein was motivated to use me the same as he used everybody else. You thought you were different? I never suspected the degree of monstrous behavior, the degree of misconduct, the degree of victimizing me, the degree of setting me up executed by Jeffrey Epstein. I did not at any time believe that that would occur. Skeptics often point out that there's something about Hoffenberg's allegations that doesn't sound entirely plausible, even with all his explanations. Why would anyone agree to go to jail for almost 20 years and let Jeffrey walk off with his money without putting up more of a fight? Yet my gut feeling is that Hoffenberg has nothing to gain by lying at this point. These days, he cuts a pale, thin figure that's a far cry from who he once was. It's clear that he desperately needs money. It's also clear that he likes the relevance and the attention that the Epstein story has brought him. But any money he gets from this, he must legally return to the victims of Towers Financial. You can tell when you talk to him that he is still very, very angry with Jeffrey Epstein and a little frustrated that journalists are skeptical about what he has to say. Nobody's telling the truth anymore. Right. Everybody is saying, no, that's not what happened. But meanwhile, the evidence shows what Jeffrey Epstein did. There's a preponderance of evidence that shows what he did. There's no question of what he did. Everything Jeffrey Epstein says is a fiction. A lie. You know that. You dealt with him one to one. He's a liar. Pathological liar. The evidence he's talking about is in the Tower bankruptcy records. So he says, we tried to get hold of those. But unfortunately, at the time of this recording, they are in storage in the National Archive in Kansas. And due to the pandemic, they are temporarily closed. Hoffenberg finished his prison sentence in 2016. He started emailing me almost daily about a lawsuit against Jeffrey that was an effort to get money back for the tower's victims. And soon after he got out of jail, he went to see Jeffrey. My, my wife and I were there. We knocked on the doors. That's Hoffenberg's lawyer, Gary Bays. Hoffenberg told Gary that he could use Jeffrey's apartment in Paris on an upcoming trip. So together, they went to Jeffrey's house in New York to ask him. And, I, and frankly, I wanted to see just how close this guy was to Epstein. I'd heard all these stories. But we walked over, I think it's 72. And I think it has J.E. on either the front. J.E. on, yes, yes, it does. Yes, or it did. Either on the front or on the side, uh, inside. Anyway, a lady comes to the door. He introduces himself, introduces my wife and myself. And uh, he, I think he fully expected we would go in and see Mr. Epstein. Well, 
This lady comes back and says, in essence, Mr. In fact, I think her exact quote was, Mr. Epstein will not see you. I thought maybe it was just because as a lawyer I was uh, with him, but we were not allowed past the door. Was, and then how did Mr. Hoffenbach react? Sort of laughed about it. As he, I think laughingly embarrassed. Because I, I truly think that he felt that Mr. Epstein would see us. Or, or we wouldn't have done it. That would be my guess. I don't know. But uh, it, was, it was slightly embarrassing, sure. It's really hard to hear this and not feel for Hoffenberg. If one-tenth of what he says is true about Jeffrey Epstein, the indignities that he has suffered because of his association with him are really something. I mean, Hoffenberg was no angel, and it was his choice to hire Jeffrey. But wow, has he paid the price over and over and over. My wife died because of this. She did? Yes. When you were in jail? Right after I got out. Was it the stress? Yes. That's very, very sad. It's, this is a tragedy. A tragedy that I'm just trying to explain. My wife died over this case. And it's a tragedy. And I'm the scapegoat, the mark for Jeffrey Epstein. Unsurprisingly, Jeffrey was extremely annoyed when I found out in 2002 about his connection to Hoffenberg. Here's the first time that I brought it up with him. What I want to ask you is what your relationship with Hoffenberg was. Okay. You know, there are court documents showing that he paid you a consulting fee of 25 grand. And you know, there are financial statements showing that he gave you loans and things. He gave me loans? Yes. There are records of this. No. But if all his records... No. Maybe. There's no court document that's my name on it. Yes. There are. From his company? From... Yeah. It wouldn't be his. His records were frozen. That's why he went to jail. So you can hear he's defensive. He definitely did not want me to know what had really gone on between Hoffenberg and him. Next, we're talking about the bid for Pan Am and Emery Airlines. I had a tremendous amount of money, he said, to do the deal. And like all his financial statements, it turned out to be fraudulent. Sorry, who had a tremendous amount of money to do the deal? Hoffenberg. He scammed a lot of people, but I don't think he'll find a loan to me. I know what a source close to him claims that he did him. make that you really a loan. Say much. Co-cellmate. I don't think he's made a loan to anybody. Is it true that he, though, paid the rent on your offices in the Villard house? No, of course not. So then what happened after Pan Am and Emery? I mean, what, you know, after those bids? He went to jail. In another conversation, I showed my hand. I explained that I had court documents as evidence that he was financially tied to Hoffenberg. I told Jeffrey that they showed quite plainly that he'd received monthly payments from Hoffenberg and that he'd also received a loan for two million dollars. Are you going to write that there's something not right? Well, I need to ask you. you and that wasn't the question. Are you alleging that there was something not right? Well, we're not, we're not, there are certain things, and those things I have to ask you. Okay. Go ahead. Now I had to ask Jeffrey about his involvement with some of the things that I knew Hoffenberg had done, and for which Hoffenberg sat in prison as we spoke. I had to ask about the scheme to use insurance bonds for the Pan Am and Emery airline bids. So did you have any idea that Hoffenberg took bonds out of Illinois to New York? Uh, I don't know. Most of his transactions, uh, no. No? No. Okay, and did you ever get asked by the regulators or the insurance companies where those assets were? Where his what? Where the... Well, my understanding is that Hoffenberg financed Pan Am and Emery by taking bonds out of two insurance companies. He never financed Pan Am and Emery. He never financed them? No, he never went ahead. He had no money. But no... One of the things that he got indicted for... Right. ...was raping those two insurance companies. Yeah, but that had nothing to do with Pan Am, or 
He yeah. claims they were. That's why I have to ask you about this. Yes, he went around basically saying that he had a great deal of money to be able to finance a Pan Am transaction, and he was buying, I think, airplanes and boats. Now it turned out that all those monies, I believe, were stolen from an insurance company or mis... Uh, you know, he took the insurance company money and put it in his own pocket. Okay. So that was... You were never aware, and no one ever asked you to give testimony or... No, I was never called. By the way... I've recently discovered that this was one more piece of total bullshit. According to a source who must remain anonymous, Jeffrey did spend three days testifying to a grand jury about all of this. Ghislaine even booked Jeffrey into a very expensive suite in Chicago in the early 1990s where he stayed during his testimony. Unfortunately, I don't have access to it. Grand jury testimonies are typically sealed. I didn't know that at the time of this conversation. But my reporter's spidey sense was tingling, so I kept pressing him on it. I wasn't involved in that whole trial or anything. I know, but were... Did... Not, even a, as, not even as a witness, nobody. Did the insurance companies never ask you? No. So you were never involved with a plan where the insurance no. companies purchased treasury bonds for $500,000 that looked like it was free and clear when in fact it was collateralized? By the way... Executives from the insurance companies told me on the record that they'd asked Jeffrey about the bonds because they knew that he was involved with them. No, again, I wasn't involved in anything financially that he did. He said he had a great deal of money behind him to be able to finance this bid. He had the union leaders of Pan Am right. with John Lehman, Secretary of the Navy, in an office. He said he was willing to finance it. How would you go about structuring a takeover? So, uh, nothing to do with the money. I finally tracked down John Lehman and asked him about Jeffrey's claims. Lehman told me that he'd had nothing to do with the financing of Pan Am. He explained that at the time he had recently retired from politics and consulted briefly, just for a few months, with Towers. And then he took a job at an investment bank. He did recall that Hoffenberg had asked him his views on Pan Am. Since Lehman had some industry knowledge... Hoffenberg asked him if he'd be the CEO, but that's as far as the discussions went. Lehman doesn't recall meeting Jeffrey. But hey-ho, Jeffrey never let the truth get in the way of his version of events. Here's more. So you never got involved with any of the internal... I mean, you were never just involved with this sort of external... External strategy. I, I didn't know where the money was coming. I had no idea what his money situation was. I thought he had a lot of money. So an allegation that was made was that you manipulated the stock price of Emery Air Freight to minimize losses by selling one client's account, let's say $6 a share, and getting someone else to buy it at $6 a share when the market price might have been $5 a share. That's ridiculous. But that was what was in Hoffenberg's grand jury testimony. Okay, and again, and the other allegation... What was the allegation, even? I don't understand the allegation. Well, that you manipulated the stock price of Emery Air Freight to minimise losses. For who? For Hoffenberg. No, definitely not. I had nothing to do with the finances of the company. The people basically... You know, he called me in to say that he wanted my advice on how to structure a takeover. That's basically it. But I had no idea where the money was coming from, except that he seemed to have had a lot of it. In fact, a source tells me that the genesis of the Pan Am bid came from Jeffrey, not Hoffenberg. That's because a close friend of Jeffrey's had fed him inside information on the struggling airline's increasingly dire performance. In another conversation, Jeffrey threatened to sue me personally over what I might write about his association with Hoffenberg. Remember, my conversations with Jeffrey were originally off the record, but we're releasing them now because of the public interest. Note how he also brings up the pharmacists here. You put in whatever you want, and if I don't like it, I'll sue you guys. I'm not doing that. No way. Our off the record is really off the record. Okay. I wanted to be helped, even in terms of, uh, because my mother's sick, I had to come back down here. I, I couldn't do photographs. I've been trying to be helpful by sending you guys some photographs. I understand. I don't want to be... I understand. Uh, uh, but tell me, the farmer stuff? The stuff we talked about. How can I rebut it if you're not... Do you see what I'm saying? How can I rebut it if I'm not on the record? Do you want me to say a spokesperson for Jeffrey says... No, I don't. I think you should... Look, you take the... 
I don't know what you're writing. Basically, you paraphrase some of it to me. If there's any implication of wrongdoing, I will take legal action against you personally. I'm telling you so you understand. I will be as harsh as I possibly can personally. Not for the magazine, but you. Because I had this discussion with you. This relationship is with you. No, it isn't, Jeffrey. I'm a professional journalist doing a job for the magazine. I'm telling you. I want you to be clear. My relationship with you is friendly. If you Jeffrey, decide... I'm doing this as a job. This is not... Uh, you I... might not... Uh, you shouldn't risk your future as a job. I'm not risking anything. I'm doing my job to report. To, to report. And, and this is not about a personal thing. This is about doing a professional job. That's why I was put on this assignment. And that is what I... And I'm doing an assignment for Vanity Fair. Let me... I'm clear. The concept of having an allegation that basically... You have to make the decision as a journalist what you think are reliable sources. Yes. If you think you have a reliable source and a reliable allegation, you make it. I will hold you personally responsible. And I have a very long patience level. I think it's wrong. I've told you my side. I think you have an obligation to figure out a way to do it. I can't tell you how to do it. I'm not going on the record. And if you want to say, well, he refused to respond, I, I guess that's good enough for you, but I wouldn't do it if I were you. I mean, I've heard about the Hoffenberg stuff. You have someone who's spending time 18 years in jail for lying about financial statements and basically lying. And then you ask me a question about his financial statements, say this. How do you respond? <laughs> He's in jail for bad stuff. He's in jail for filing bad financial statements. Okay, so we... That will obviously be made clear. So I wouldn't respond to a convicted felon making any allegation. And the thing about the Emory stock, which sort of says something about uh, manipulation, is the same concept. I find it unbelievable that you would even listen to some of these people. I think it's unfair. That's it for now. That's it. And I'm obviously going to report back to our lawyers, okay? I'm sorry this has gotten this way. You might imagine that by now, I knew that I was dealing with somebody who was pretty much incapable of speaking the truth. Journalists are supposed to be objective, but when I think back up to that conversation, and I still remember it, it would be fair to say that at that moment, I think I absolutely hated Jeffrey Epstein. But here's what I kept wondering. Why was he so reluctant to talk about Hoffenberg, Lise, any of his past? Why did he lie and lie and lie? Something about his mendacity and his secrecy really niggled me. It was just a part of the puzzle. In fact, many parts that I just hadn't solved yet. It bugged the hell out of me. So here's what I think now, based on my new reporting, and also what we know about Jeffrey that we didn't in 2002. Of course, Jeffrey wanted Hoffenberg locked up and shut away. Because in the 1990s, Jeffrey was about to put into practice what the two of them had plotted. We now know that a lot of wealthy so-called Epstein clients would later claim that Jeffrey made them a lot of money. And then they'd discover that he'd also taken some of it. And they'd have a fight with him about that. Hoffenberg wasn't just somebody who collaborated with Jeffrey's financial crimes. He was a witness to the crimes. So Jeffrey discarded Hoffenberg as cleanly as he could. And then he turned to his next target. He was looking for very rich individuals to either help them find stolen money or fix bad investment schemes. And he was going to take some of that money for himself. He was about to play the box. What he needed was somebody who would introduce him to billionaires. Well, we know now who that was. Ghislaine Maxwell. Hoffenberg says that Jeffrey told him that his relationship with Ghislaine was about much more than just romance. Did Jeffrey explain why he was attracted to Ghislaine? Yes. What was the answer? Jeffrey was impressed with Robert Maxwell's businesses and the size of Robert Maxwell's investments and the relationships that Robert Maxwell had around the world. 
And that impressed Jeffrey Epstein greatly with Jerome Maxwell, who became a very important part of Jeffrey Epstein's business and assisted Jeffrey Epstein in securing millions and millions and millions of dollars. Remember, as far as the Maxwell family is aware, according to a source with knowledge, Jeffrey met Ghislaine in 1991. But Hoffenberg also says that Jeffrey knew Ghislaine's father, Robert Maxwell, in the 1980s. He's echoing Ari Ben Menashe, Amer Pasha, and Ed Epstein. He knew Maxwell from Wall Street from his travels on Wall Street, because Robert Maxwell was involved in many efforts in the United States at that time. And that's, don't forget, Jeffrey was at Bear Stearns, was an investment banker, and had exposure to people in Robert Maxwell's circle for many decades. So why, so there, we interviewed some of Robert Maxwell's biographers who say that there's no trace of Jeffrey Epstein's name in um, Robert Maxwell's, you know, a contacts book. Why do you think that is? Well, because Jeffrey was lower profile at that time. Jeffrey was always off the radar and was not trying to become important to the media. That wasn't what his interest was. But there's no question of his involvement with the Maxwell family and the causes that they represented. There's no doubt of that. Robert Maxwell was in a financial bind and needed to restructure his debt and obligations with a plan of reorganization. Jeffrey Epstein advised Robert Maxwell on how to reposition his debt, the money he owed, in order to get out of the financial bind he was stuck in at that time. And Jeffrey Epstein was starting to advise Robert Maxwell on his different options of how to reorganize his funding of money around the world. Maxwell liked Jeffrey, both Ben Menashe and Hoffenberg say. And according to them, in the late 1980s, Maxwell introduced Jeffrey to some of his Israeli network. Now, Ben Menashe claims to have been present for this. I know that Robert Maxwell took him to Israel. Yes, I was there. So why did Robert Maxwell bring Jeffrey Epstein to Israel to recruit him? He didn't know what to do with him. He wanted to get him a job. In my view, it's just a guess. It's not, I don't have direct knowledge of it. He didn't want him working in his office or with him. He wanted to send them off somewhere else. Ben Menashe says that the Israelis were divided about whether Jeffrey should be used as some sort of intelligence asset. Personally, he was against it. He couldn't see the point of Jeffrey. He thought he was reckless, dangerous, bad for Israel's reputation. He just didn't want to have anything to do with him. But Maxwell took him to Israel and was... Another group of Israeli intelligence people picked picked him up exactly for the reasons that why we didn't want to have anything to do with him. In other words, they picked him up because he was a con artist and a thief. Correct. So please, uh, Jeffrey, I'm sorry for the words, but would have fucked the dog if he had to. And there was more. Jeffrey told Steve Hoffenberg that what the Israelis wanted was far more than just off-the-record arms dealing and money laundering. They wanted him to gain access to powerful Americans who could help Israel. They were aware that he might use any means necessary to gain leverage and information, including blackmail. Well, we come back to this allegation then of the influence campaign. 
they were trying to blackmail politicians, powerful people. Is that what you're talking about? That's only one component, blackmail. Influence trading, information trading. Right. At the level we're discussing by these three men is very serious and dangerous. Ben Menashe claims that the pressure to exert an influence campaign in America intensified when Bill Clinton was to become president in 1993. According to Ben Menashe, the Israelis were extremely nervous that the US would turn pro-Palestinian. Viktor Ostrovsky says he can't corroborate that, but... Looking for influence with the American president? Who isn't? Ostrovsky says that the Israelis often work with civilians to influence powerful people. There's a name for that today, which is called perception makers. Perception makers. Yeah, it's like you have a PR firm. Mm -hmm. It's like a PM firm. It's a perception maker. Because what you say is, okay, if I tell you the Russians are bad and I can bring things that made it happen that, they, you know, that they're responsible for A, B, C, and D, I can create the perception, whether it's true or not, of something being real. Sources say that Maxwell was also interested in Jeffrey for something else besides Israel. Here's Amir Pasha. And Adnan told you that Robert Maxwell was really fond of Jeffrey. Yes. And Adnan told you that Robert Maxwell wanted his daughter to marry him. wanted him as the son-in-law. The achievement at the end of it is that I feel that my life, which I'm continuing to live to the full, and will do so until the day I die, I will have left the world a slightly better place by having lived in it and have influenced a few things and people in the right direction, rather if, as if it hadn't mattered whether I were born or lived or died. Maxwell was given a hero's funeral in Jerusalem, where he's buried on the Mount of Olives. But within just days of his death, a shocking crime came to light. Here's Martin Dillon. Maxwell has stolen the pension funds of the Daily Murder newspaper. The pension funds of 25,000 people. He was going down, and he was going down in a big way. Maxwell had stolen hundreds of millions of pounds from his own newspaper's pension fund, and the police knew about it. Victor Ostrovsky alleges that Maxwell had asked the Mossad for financial help. When they refused, things got ugly. Ostrovsky left the Mossad several years before this happened. He didn't understand that you, you do not threaten the Mossad. I mean, you, you can do a lot of other things, but do not threaten them because they take that very seriously. So when a threat is made, it basically cuts all the history or good history that was there and valuable and whatever, and it's just, it's all gone through the window. So do you, you think Robert Maxwell was killed by the Mossad? I think so, yeah. So that's one possible theory as to why Maxwell may have been murdered. Here's Ari Ben Menashe. I believe that Robert Maxwell had to be gotten rid of because he was about to be arrested by the British police and he would have had to go on trial and go through details that the Israelis and others did not want to be made public. It wasn't just his narcissism any longer. Martin Dillon, again. He was becoming very, very uh, uncontrollable. And I think that Mossad knew that at the end had come. And it's not as if Israel hasn't, you know, in the past decided that uh, someone has to, you know, has to go. Robert Maxwell was dead, but his estate was still on the hook for the missing funds. Two of his sons, Ian and Kevin, were charged with conspiring to help him. But after a year-long trial, Kevin and Ian were both acquitted. Tom Bauer says that at the start of the trial, he didn't think they had a hope of winning. But their defence was extraordinary. 
82 bankers, accountants, and lawyers and fellow directors of the company. And each one of them was uh, rigorously cross-examined and left the witness box uh, demeaned and often discredited. The Maxwell family was stripped by the British government of all of their material assets. But did Robert Maxwell, with all of his international connections and cunning mindset, squirrel away money offshore? Both Martin Dillon and Tom Bauer think that that is exactly what happened. They say that Robert Maxwell had ensured that there was hidden money. Robert Maxwell was hiding money for many, many years. He had accounts in places like Liechtenstein. Yeah, and there's no doubt that some of the money that Robert stole was in the bank accounts, not only in Liechtenstein, but more importantly, in the Cayman Islands and the Virgin Islands. So, in case you missed that, the Maxwell fortune, or some of it, might have survived through these bank accounts. But according to eyewitnesses, Galen appeared, at least, to be without access to it. It was a drastic U-turn. The heiress, suddenly without money. The daughter, suddenly without her controlling father. Now, many of my sources thought that the Jeffrey Galen relationship was something that grew out of his kindness to her after her father died. But was there more to it? He was advising Maxwell on the moves with the pension money. So, it hadn't occurred to me when I first reported on Jeffrey that there may have been other reasons that Galen turned to him. That, as Ari Ben Menashe and Steve Hoffenberg suggest, she went to the man that her father had wanted her to be with. A man who was good at facilitating deals, at hiding money. A man who was friendly with senior Israeli government officials. The so-called Mr. Invisible. Jeffrey Epstein. Take me back to this 1980s, because Ari ben Menashe says that's when Ghislaine was smitten by Jeffrey Epstein and Robert Maxwell brings her in, uh, brings her in and then him in, Jeffrey Epstein in, to introduce him to Ari ben Menashe and says, we want this guy to work for us doing Iran-Contra. Can you confirm any of those details? I can help you understand the timeline and who participated with Jeffrey Epstein and how he became a spy, and what he did when he became a spy. I can help you in all those areas, because I was there. You were there? I did. Did I he tell you? These did he tell you I'm a spy? Did he go and say I'm working yes. for the Israelis? Yes. He mm. told me that he was a spy. He was fully aware that I was asked to join to be a spy, and that I rejected the request. Because so Douglas Lee's asked you to, to join them and be a spy. And you said, no, I don't want to have anything to do with that. I rejected the request of the spying. Okay. Jeffrey Epstein accepted the request of the spying. And he further cemented his opportunity in espionage when he met Jerome Maxwell and entered into a serious relationship with her mm. as a lady man relationship that was mm. a very strong bond between them a very powerful and dynamic work relationship between the two of them and they've admitted to the public that they took over Robert Maxwell's spying records operations mm and moved that to Florida, to Jeffrey Epstein's house. That's been admitted. That's a fact. 